My name is Jeff Fletcher. I'm going to be presenting how to build a map using D3 at the Cape Town Data Viz Meeting. As you can see, I have done this before. So I've done this presentation a few times. Um, today, what we're going to do is we're going to build an interactive D3 map of South Africa. So I'm going to host part four. We're going to build that. This is a ward level map showing uh, each of the individual wards in South Africa. It uh, is also implemented using what's known as a coropleth. Coropleth is a color map. It's made of the word coro, meaning color, and pleth, meaning the sound that you make when you eat an olive, thinking it's a grape. <laughs> but, um, it's interactive. It allows you to zoom in, move around, grab a few bits and pieces, um, and I'll take you through the process of getting it from source data to that. So, there is this GitHub page that has um, the code that you can download and links to all of the sites that I'm going to take you through as we go. Um, if you have any questions, just stop me. It's kind of a meetup. It's not a big formal TED talk. Um, and if you want to know anything or you have any queries, just get hold of me via my website uh, or just mail me, jeff.fletcher at is, um, and I'll see what I can do. Um, what was the other thing in terms of preparation for this that I wanted to say? Yes, I'm not a professional programmer by trade, so if anyone has really in-depth knowledge of JavaScript as to why I'm wrong, you may leave the room now. Okay, <laughs> so to make this map, I had to start by getting source data. I had to go and get a shape file that has all of the coordinates. So someone has, there's all these GIS tools and all these bits of GIS software that have uh, been created and the South African government is the custodians of that. So the digital format of what the maps of South Africa are, are available via a site called the Demarcations Board. So what the Demarcations Board does, they have, stuff that you can download. So they have the map of South Africa, so they've got the outer layer. They then have, um, you can delve down, let me take one step further in. Uh, from there you can go into the local municipalities, then subdivided into that is the districts, and subdivided into that is the wards. So I want to take you through the process of getting this into a useful format. So let's download a copy of the province, 3.8 meg. What I'm downloading is the shape file. So this is a GIS specific stuff. This is, but it's in a GIS format. It's not in web format. And 3.8 meg is quite big, as you can see the, the amount of time it's taking to download this. So it's quite big, not applicable to internet format. And the browser doesn't understand it. So we have to take this, and we have to take it through a transfer process to get it into something that's a little bit more useful. So then we're going to take it through the conversion process, and there's a site, uh, I think somewhere in Germany, that uh, will provide it. So, and finder, there's our province, but it's got a raw file inside. Yay. Okay. Uh, downloads. Yay. Now I need to convert that into something that's internet related. So there's two technologies that work for um, in for, for mapping on browsers and those are GeoJSON and TopoJSON. So we need to start to get it into GeoJSON so we can do some manipulations and then the next stage we're going to take it to is uh, called TopoJSON. GeoJSON is using JavaScript object notation. Does everyone know what JSON is? Okay, cool. So it basically creates shapefile for you and inside the shapefile it says that this ward is demarcated by these particular line segments so it draws the line segment it will say next to it is another ward and it will draw that particular line segment so each one of those wards gets drawn and gets delineated inside the GeoJSON file and then it has descriptors to say what it is so it would give it its name it would give it the ward number it would give you area inside it will give you the length of the line so now we choose a file <coughs> We upload it to their site and they will do the conversion for us. So, submit. 
and go. And these guys have the ability, they've got a, a processing system that will convert between the different formats. This is where I discovered that um, they changed by adding a RAR inside it. Because I uploaded it and said convert, and it didn't convert because it was a RAR. Um, they can export it into GeoJSON, into TopoJSON, into other shapefile formats, other type of GIS formats. So there are varying capabilities that they have. But specifically, we want to extract GeoJSON because we want to merge a few together. And in that merge process, we want to extract one final TopoJSON file. Just to explain the difference then between GeoJSON and TopoJSON, where GeoJSON delineates every single ward, what TopoJSON does is says that there is this, uh, let's take this ward over here. That ward over here shares a border. So I'm doubling up on the amount of information if I describe that one or I'm making it more if I describe each and every single one. So there is an overlay of lines. There are lines that go together. So it describes a grid of intersecting lines that forms the pattern. It then says that if you take that number of particular dots, it creates that ward. So it then can say, uh, let's say dots 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, create that ward, and dots 1, 2, 3, 7, 8, 9, create another ward. It then creates a mapping of where the wards exist. It doesn't actually draw them. So in that way, you reduce the total amount of data that you have to store in order to um, create it. So the, the internet format uh, for TopoJSON requires a little bit more overhead in terms of the browser, but computing is much cheaper than bandwidth. So it's much easier to deal with it on that basis. So it's better to ship TopoJSON because it's quicker to get down. Then and let it do a little bit more computing than do it the other way around. So I'm busy uploading it. Um, I'll just leave it running. We can get to that point later. But it's now going to give me an option to say extract it into GeoJSON. You just leave all the defaults because then it makes sure that it keeps all of the original bits of information. It doesn't like it drop anything because each um, each particular uh, ward has its ID, it has its name, it has all of that there. So when it extracts it in GeoJSON format, it just makes sure that information comes through. Okay, so then the next step, I'll leave that running, we can come back and have a look in a moment, is to combine it into TopoJSON format. So, TopoJSON is written by Mike Bostock. Who knows who Mike Bostock is? There we go, Mike Bostock is very cool. He has a very cool beard and he makes very cool uh, data visualizations for the New York Times and he invented D3. Um, yeah. So uh, he also helped write the TopoJSON code and we're going to run the command line now to go and merge um, two, particular, two particular files. So usually sitting around about there based on what you're going to do for a website or if it's working on a tablet, you don't necessarily need more fidelity than that. From there, you can say export, and it will export the JSON file for you. So now you have one that's reduced, that makes a little bit more sense in terms of um, uh, s transmitting it over the web or over to a mobile phone, and you have the JSON representation. That's all we have now. So all we have now is a nice small version of South Africa that gives us the wards and gives us the provinces, um, and has it all contained inside the JSON. So the next step is we need to actually put it on t into the browser which is where we start jumping into D3. <coughs> so part one, um, we're going through code now. So please don't comment on my code. Um, <laughs> there are three libraries that I need to load. The first is just the normal D3 library. So the D3 library is what does all of this mapping stuff. Um, how familiar are you with D3 in general? Can I give you a quick overview? So what D3 does as a uh, JavaScript library. Its job is to connect to some data, whatever format that data may be, and connect that data to something on your browser, something in the DOM. So let's say I have tables and I have a list of names, and I have 20 tables and 20 names. It would bind those 20 names to the 20 rows in that table. But if I change that table to go from 20 to 10, I need this to change in a corresponding manner. So it does a whole bunch of clever binding in real time in terms of the actual uh, the DOM and in terms of the data. And it can run, it can uh, dynamically change the size of what you're seeing on the site. So you'll have a lot of things that are visualization. So the pie charts are built as a series of arcs that is bound to a data set or a series of uh, rectangles that creates a bar chart 
that's bound to a data set. And in a fairly real time, in a fairly quick succession, you can update that, plus you can use animations. So you can get it to move and transition smoothly. So it looks really, really good. It kind of does what a lot of early Flash used to do, but it's now all inside HTML and all inside JavaScript. So it works really well and it's quite quick. So we need to have that library installed. There's an extension to it, which is topo.json. And the third one is queuing. So queuing gets rid of this annoying feature that's JavaScript and callbacks. The fact that JavaScript is asynchronous and just happens all the time, <coughs> you, if you're loading data, it's executing code underneath it. It doesn't wait. It doesn't necessarily follow through all the way through. So this allows you to say only execute the code once you've done these three things. And those three things that we need to do at some point is loading different data sets in. The variables we use, width and height, that's how big we want to uh, build it in. Then we have to choose a projection. So projections are the thing where you take a map uh, or the earth and you convert it into a map. So when you basically stretch it out and put it, and we all seen those, we had them in uh, class at school as kids. You had one that had a really, really big Greenland and a really, really big long Antarctica. That's the Mercator projection. So that is the mathematics of transforming a sphere into a flat space. There's different kinds, but the most, the, the most commonly used one is the Mercator one. Um, we have to specify where on the map we are, so those are GPS coordinates for where the center is. Just with a bit of trial and error, I had to scale and translate, and scale means change the size, so given that my topo JSON is this big, I have to expand it, I have to make it bigger, and then translate was just to move it, because once um, it was on the SVG, the center was in the wrong spot, so I had to move it over. So that moved it across. Then. This is, this is where the D3 magic happens. So this is the calculation that converts a dot in, uh, on the topo JSON to an actual thing, a uh, GPS coordinate in real life. I don't understand how that code works. I just know it needs to be there. And as long as it's there, lots of magic happens in the background and I get what I want. Um, so we have to first create the, the, the object in memory for D3 to bind to. So D3 uses standard CSS selectors, so you basically, like you would use with jQuery, hash something or dot something, it uses those same selectors to decide what it is. I'm going to go and select hash SVG, but has, hash SVG at this point in time uh, is that. So it's binding itself to that. Then I'm going to append an SVG into that. And I'm going to give it the attributes. Then I'm going to create two things. I'm going to create wards and I'm going to create provinces. So the Gs are groups. So inside SVG, I'm just going to create a group that sits inside it. Then I'm going to start populating that with the mapping information. So this is the function that draws it. Um, the way um, it's passed via Q. Q passes two things. It passes an error if it doesn't work and it passes the data as the uh, second variable. So with D3, I'm now wanting to create a whole bunch of ward maps. So I give it a class, and this is the point at which the data binding happens. I then say the data that you want to bind to this is this function which we created, that uh, this topo JSON function. And this again is a little bit of magic where it iterates through the map, takes each one and says, okay, you're a ward, you're a ward, you're a ward, you're a ward, and binds it to the, the dot ward map class. Enter is part of their mechanism to say it's now bound. So you've said this is the data, but the data, the data set, you're now binding it to the DOM object. So you created the items and then you bound the two together. Um, you append the path, and the path is the actual map that it has to traverse, or the little uh, SVG path that it, uh, it travels along. And then we set an attribute, which is the, the class for the ward map. Here is where I load the data. Technically, I could actually just call d3.json um, as a normal function call. I didn't have to use Q, but as we get a little bit more complex and we add more data, then I have to start using um, the Q function. And that creates this map. OK, so based on that, I've created something that I can't do much with. But you can see what we've got is working. It's on the screen. It's in the right place. Except the fact that I didn't like the shape. So I am, um, this is actually slightly squashed um, in terms of the projector, but normally on my screen, it's slightly elongated. And generally when you see the map of South Africa on the news, or on the weather, it's a little bit more wide that way because of the fact of our 16 by 9 TVs now. So it looks wrong. 
So I wasn't happy with the format that it was in. So one of the things I wanted to do was change the projection. And there's lots of projections and lots of jokes about people who like projections. There's this particularly good XKCD comic, but you can go have a look there. Um, the projections that I went through, I tried a whole bunch of them, and then I picked a particular one that gave the, the look and feel that I was more comfortable with. It was just, it was an aesthetic thing. There was no specific reason to choose one over the other. Um, and then I needed to style it. So I needed to start making it look a little bit neater. So in the next bit of code, uh, part two, we've now started to add some styling to it. So now we're adding styling into the SVG itself. So when I created each of those individual polygons, in fact, let me show you some code here. There's the SVG that gets created, and there's the paths. So <coughs> these are the paths that have got drawn and got created at runtime. Um, and the provinces, we haven't drawn the provinces yet. We'll draw that in the next round. And the class is in that particular one, so you can see it's got a class of ward map. So it depends the class ward map as it goes. And there's quite a few of these because there's over 4,000 wards. So it would be quite an arduous task to do this manually. OK. So as part two of the code, we start to add in SVG styling. SVG is very, styling in SVG is very similar to normal CSS, except for a couple of things. So the, you, if you're doing text, you don't do color, you use fill for the text. You have to specify certain lines. Uh, you have to use like stroke and stroke width for lines. To get the, the to get that to follow through, but most of it's Googleable. You can just figure out if it's not working what, that you're using the wrong attribute. Um, the one gotcha with SVG is that how the line renders, whether it's a crisp line or whether it's a blurry line, depends on your browser because they both take different approaches to uh, to aliasing. So in some cases, you have to add 0.5 of a point uh, to a line to get it to actually be a crisp line. You can also use an attribute called crisp edges, but then you have you don't have anti-aliasing, so then you have those um, staggered lines that go through. So if you're making like you rotating squares or anything like that, it won't look great. And you just kind of figure out which looks best and who you're going for, because this is one of those things that the SVG standard is not the same between um, WebKit and Gecko. I think is what's on Firefox now. Okay, so setting the styling. This is also the change I made to the um, projection. So I changed to the Albert's projection. And carry on going through. Um, and this is where I start to add in the provinces. Now the provinces are interesting because from an overlay perspective, I don't actually need the whole province. I don't need the province individualized. I just need the grid because I don't actually need to see, I'm not doing any color changes to it. So rather than binding on a topology basis for the for each individual province, I use what's known as a mesh. And the mesh just draws one layer and draws it on top. Um, and I create that instead of being, so you can see that the data binding is datum. So it's a single data point rather than multiple data points. The rest is pretty much the same. And it gives us, in part two, it starts to look a little bit better. So now we have some styling into it. We've added a little bit of capability. And the provinces are now clearly visible. Um, and it's also a little bit more spread out that way. Don't you think that map looks so much better? OK. So the next step in this process is we need to start adding color, and we need to start um, adding in the data. So our wonderful stats essay, if I can get the website up and running, provide you an interface to go and have a look at population by ward. You get the idea. On there, it's a grid. You have to go and extract each one. But what it gave me was the ward number, and um, it also gave me the ward population. So specifically, those are the two things that I need. So I'll have a look inside the actual JSON file for you now, so you can see where. Uh, let's do this. Geography. Okay, I'm good. Uh, there we go. There's one. Houston Cape. Okay, so now we need to start. Um, 
building. So the third part of it is where we get a little bit more in terms of the data. So the first thing is also we have to choose a color scheme. So if you're wanting to choose a particular, um, from a data visualization perspective, if you're wanting to choose colors that are representing numbers or representing some kind of categorization, it's a website called Color Brewer, which I've got on, uh, should have linked to you on the, the meet, uh, GitHub page. Color Brewer was made by the woman by the name of Cynthia Brewer. She did a lot of research into how human beings understand color and the references of colors between different color spaces. In RGB, the tendency is for us to just increment things. So you would increase the density of colors or make changes on a linear numeric scale, but it's actually not how our brains work. So she's created different color spaces and the HSL space came from some of the work that she did. But she also gives you the ability to use the, um, she, she will generate, in fact, I'm going to show you the website. Mm -hmm. uh, she will let you pick particular color sets that are useful in a specific instance. So if you've got colors that is a range going from like lowest to highest, she will present you a color set that you can use. If it's diverging, so you've got a middle point, so you're going from um, sort of high, medium, low, she presents a divergent one, or something that's ordinal, so they're not related like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever it may, may be, or types of fruit or something, she pre presents those as well. And they safe in terms of human understanding, so you can also choose it for it to be colorblind safe or printer safe or one of, the, or one of those things. It's a great resource to go to um, just to do testing. So we had, oh, I think I used about nine, my data set. Uh, I used a particular, I think I used, that was the color scheme I used. And then you can export it as well and you can basically grab it as an RGB set to use on your website. Uh, diverging will give it where you've got something that sits in the middle and qualitative um, is something that's not so it's ordinal so it's not specific um, in terms of what it describes so they're not necessarily related to each other okay so I grabbed a color set from color Brewer. I added that as my color list this is still all the same when we get into this point here as I'm starting to go through so I've now drawn I've got my provinces drawn um, as I go through the style, <coughs> I need to, here, this is the bit of code that I first added. So I pull in a population map. So now I've got a CSV file, and the CSV file simply says the ward number and the population number, um, and that also gets loaded now at the same time. So if you go have a look at the queue at the bottom, I've got population.csv. Uh, and in loading that, one of the things that I found in trying to optimize this is that CSV is actually a much better format because of the fact that it reduces the file size. JSON is very descriptive and good for people to read, but it's a little bit harder in terms of it adds a whole bunch of extra layers into the data. Specifically the format that D3 likes it in. D3 likes to have its JSON as um, key as the identifier that is repeated all the way through, and then the value changing. So you don't necessarily have a ward ID, and then the number, and then population, and then the number. So it just adds overhead in terms of the amount of data that you want to use. When you use J the D3 CSV import, it converts that into the right format in memory, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, so I go through the map, and I'm basically creating what is effectively a key value pair store um, inside D3. It has a function called a map, and it's then going to create that internally. So it's going to give me the ward name and the population, so I can do a quick lookup on that, and it builds an in-memory uh, database. Uh, then as I go through, now I want to give this particular ward map a color. So the I can change the fill type on the fly. So when it builds it, when it actually renders each individual um, uh, each individual ward as the SVG or as the, the, the path, I can choose a color. So the color comes back from saying, this is the ward ID. Um, get the color that's associated with it. And that's based on this scale here. So I say that the amount Actually, this is quite important. I forgot about this. There's a 
there's a scale function that you give to say, I've got this range and I need to narrow it down into this range. So often when you're doing mapping, let's say I've got numbers going from one to a million, but it needs to draw a block that goes from zero to a hundred pixels. The scaling function converts that. So it will say, this is the range, I'm going from zero to a million. In this case, I'm going from zero to the highest number in the, pop in the population. And in that, return to me something that's valid from what I'm mapping to. And in this case, it's the color list. So it will pick from uh, one of those colors. And when I return the color here, I'm basically going to get an RGB color. So as it goes through and draws the map, that's what it's going to show. And we can go through part three. And so now it draws the colors. I wasn't actually 100% happy with this map. Um, timing became a problem to fix it. The two things I think I could have fixed um, the first one being is that the color space, because of the fact that you have some very highly densely populated areas and some not so densely populated areas, you don't really get a sense of what of, of too much that is going on. So I think I could have chosen some, some slightly better colors for it. The other thing is, would it be to actually use the range, instead of doing it linearly, I could have used some kind of exponential law. So I could have used a square root or a logarithmic law or k-means or something like that. But um, the option did exist. Um, I fiddled with it uh, for a bit, but eventually I just came to like, this really gives a starting point for people to, to have a look at, um, and at some point I might make a better one. Okay, so now it doesn't do anything though. I can't grab it, I can't move it, so I need to start to improve the map to give it a little bit more capability. So, the bells and whistles. The bells and whistles, and I'll take you through that. Now, it's really adding in a whole bunch of additional functions. So the first is I want to add a tooltip. So let me just take you to what it looks like. So this allows me to, as I mouse over, I can start to add that in. D3 does a lot of this heavy lifting for you. It works out when you do a scrolling function that you're doing a scrolling function. Um, it works out and whether that's a pan or a zoom, so it says if you, which way one of those you're doing. It also knows where the mouse is on the page. It does a lot of the stuff that jQuery can do, but you don't necessarily need to load lo both libraries. Um, and it also has callback functions or specific uh, on event functions that you can bind to, in, uh, to anything that's in the DOM. So if we go here, I've added in this. This is the zooming function. So this is on zoom. It's detecting, it's now binding, and say so it, it's the, um, the, the binding that you're going to use to say if you're seeing zooming on the page, this is what you need to do with it. And I'm adding it here. So when I create the SVG, before I ended there, but now what I'm doing is I'm creating this so that when you see something that's zoomed, this is what you need to change. So uh, it's then a call on the SVG that if you're seeing zoom, this is what you need to do. That is going to call zoomed, which will actually implement the zooming function. The double click dot zoom, um, sometimes if you double click on something, uh, it will launch something else and zoom at the same time. So you want to remove it. So it just basically says if you see that, do nothing. Uh, okay, the tooltip. The tooltip is. Um, simply something that pops up when I get to a mouse over. So this creates the tooltip and hides it. So it basically builds something, it builds a div, and then hides the div. So it's sitting there, but it's not actually active at this <coughs> point in time. Zoomed function. So I take the, the, a, um, the scaling matrix. So SVG has a scaling matrix function. It's just a uh, six numbers, and what it does is uh, scaling in um, the X and Y direction, and it also has some other things that so you can skew and turn and rotate and do those type of things. Um, but we don't specifically need to worry about those. So the four and five is for moving, and zero and three is for zooming. So those are the ones that we need to do. It looks at the scale of the event and then starts to implement it. So it basically goes into the SVG and changes those attributes, so then uh, it starts to grow. Um, the one gotcha is that if you've got lines on your map, the lines grow at the same time. So as you start to zoom in, your lines get fatter. It doesn't necessarily change that. So I have to reduce the size of the lines when I'm zooming in. So if we have a look here, as I'm zooming in, these lines are being changed. The lines are otherwise would be zooming in, but getting a lot fatter at the same time. Okay, then I have these on events. 
the on mouse over um, is what calls the tooltip. So it pops the tooltip up, shows the information. So remember that at this point in time, when I'm iterating and drawing each of those things, I actually have the data set. So it's iterating through everything that was in the JSON, and that included the ward name, the ward population, the ward area. So when I create it, I can actually use that information to say, okay, well, I've got that, and I'm going to bind it to something useful. So at this point here, what I'm doing is I'm binding it to a function to say when you pop, uh, when you uh, do a mouse over, pop up the tooltip, but at the same time get the ward information to make sure that you're able to display what the ward population is and what the ward ID is. Mouse over will remove it and mouse out um, just changes it back to hidden. The nice thing that D3 does as well is it tells you where you are on the page. So the page X and the page Y information is available to you. So as I move the tooltip, I can actually move, as I move the mouse, I can move the tooltip at the same time. Okay, so that is, in a nutshell, the process that I undertook to create this. The, these are the three things. If you're getting into D3 and you've not gotten there, Mike Bostock wrote, the first two are essential. That one is uh, good to read. That is how I got to make this map. So I followed his processes. Um, that he, do, he does one of the UK. I just had to go and find data sources in different places, and it's, it's fairly similar. But there's specific things about joins, because when you've got nested data, if you think about the DOM and XML being nested, you have to think about things similarly. You want to bind, say, your table rows to one data set, but your table columns to another data set. You can re reshape the way you bring your data into memory that it will bind on that level. So if you're changing something, you're not going to change a whole table, you're just going to change some of the columns or you're going to change some of the rows. So that helps in terms of uh, joins and understanding that particular thing. Um, sorry, that's selections. Joins, so that, that's what selections describe. Joins talks about the idea of the data binding. And a lot of things that I, that I really struggled with and got wrong when I was first doing this, like I would draw an SVG and then I would try and change the, J the data and it wouldn't get rid of the old ones, so it would keep layering them on top of them. And that particular article describes very well the process of getting data in, then removing the binding from the data so that if you add new data it will go and change it. It's just syntactic, you have to follow the way it works. D3 doesn't use for loops internally, so everything is you. You just tell it that this is the data, and with that data, do the following stuff. You don't tell it in dimension, the size of the data. So therefore, you don't get stuck. So it's also different, because that's not how I would normally approach writing something like this, but it just makes it a little bit easier to read. OK, thank you very much. Cool. Thank you.